evening, Alana. This is Sherrod from the Sherrod Show. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking, and welcome to the show this evening. For those who are just tuning in, we're talking to the lovely Lana Rawls. If you do not know Miss Lana Rawls, she is the wife, uh, the widow of the uh, legendary Lou Rawls, the, one of the uh, most soulful voices, baritones you ever heard in your life. And she has a very interesting story to speak about this evening, as well as her book, uh, Love is a Hurting Thing. We're going to talk about that as well. So sit back and buckle up and enjoy my conversation with Miss Lana Rawls. Um, you have been in the music industry, affiliated with the music industry for how many years now? Oh, yes. Uh huh. So, how many years have you um, been in the industry, and in, you know, directly or indirectly, in terms of um, you know, being affiliated with your husband or some of the artists that you've met over the years? Oh, let's see. Uh, BB King. Mm hmm. Bo Diddley, um, and of course Sam Cooke mm -hmm. was a very, very dear friend of ours, mm -hmm. and um, Duke Ellington. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's safe it was, to say that it's safe to say that you've been pretty entrenched with some of the pioneers of soul music, blues music, as well as pop. Is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> and, and I was, sure have. And what was it like uh, being the wife of uh, Mr. Lou Rawls, um, who has numerous amount of hits? Um, what was it like? I'm sorry, the my doorbell was ringing. Go ahead. What'd you say, darling? What was it like being married to the legendary, um, iconic Lou Rawls, uh, the man with multiple hits, with a voice you'll never forget? Ah. Uh. Well, you know, there were only three baritone singers. Mm -hmm. That was Lou Rawls, Barry White, and Isaac Hayes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was phenomenal. Of course, our meeting, I met Lou here in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole story of that in the book. Mm -hmm. Because at that particular time, black people were not even allowed people of color weren't even allowed to be in Walgreens. Oh, in the 1960s. Wow. Now, is that where you met Lou Rawls? In the, in yes, Walgreens? I met him here in Houston. Uh-huh. Now, now, was yeah. he in the Walgreens, or where was it that you met him? No, but I'm just saying, when mm -hmm. we started seeing each other, mm -hmm. he came here, uh, someone from Capitol brought him to Houston because he had done a song called That Lucky Old Son. Mm -hmm. It probably sold, sorry, Lou, in heaven, probably 10, <laughs> ten records, okay? <laughs> but no. No, that's <laughs> no it, it didn't sell, babe. It really didn't. So now, there was now a, why, that's, that's interesting, but why, why didn't it? Because uh, Sam Cooke actually sang that song years later. The same song. Right, but Lou was unheard of. Lou was singing at the Pandora's Box uh -huh. in L.A., Mm -hmm. And Lou had not made it big in in the field at all. Okay. So um, this producer th that worked for Capital, uh, he was trying to sport Lou around because he was very interested in Lou. He loved Lou's voice. Capital wa Capital Records wanted you know Lou to be shown here in Texas and stuff. Well, I was dating the owner of the Sidewalk Cafe. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Kenny Rogers. You were dating Kenny Rogers? Yes, I dated Kenny. Oh, my then goodness. He was, well, then, he was, me... then he was <laughs> called me... with the Bobby Doyle Trio. Mm -hmm. Kenny played a stand-up bass. Bobby Doyle played the piano. And he was blind. And then they had a drummer. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And they played all over here in Houston, you know, at the dinner clubs and things like that. Now, now what drew you to, to Lou? Oh, uh, I don't need to ask what, um, what 
drew what you you drew drew him to you because I'm sure you know you're an absolutely beautiful woman even um and just now you know so many years later you're absolutely gorgeous but what was your draw towards me? You know it, it's it's hard to say, but um, this gentleman brought him there to the you know after, it was like an it was a dinner club early and then after hours at two o'clock a lot of the people here in the city would come there and listen to music till three or four o'clock in the morning with the band mm-hmm. and um, so the producer had brought Lou in there and the gentleman that I was dating that owned the place mm-hmm. Ralph Sadler uh, just fell in love with Lou's voice mm-hmm. and just Oh, everybody was clapping and standing up and everything. So it was going to be my birthday in another month. Mm -hmm. And as a surprise to me, Ralph Sadler brought Lou back to town Mm -hmm. to sing happy birthday to me. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Well, now (laughs) I see what drew you in. (laughs) And as a result of that, he did sing happy birthday to me, and then um, he got him, Mr. Sadler got him to stay here, and for like a month and a half, he paid him, you know, to to work there, because Lou was just drawing a lot of people in there, and everybody just loved his voice, mm-hmm. and Lou was, you know, like from California, and he socialized with everybody. Mm-hmm. In the cafe, well, it wasn't a cafe; it was a, a club. Mm-hmm. And but the other band members would go in in the back and sit against the wall. Mm-hmm. But Lou didn't. Lou socialized with everyone, and mm-hmm. everybody just had great admiration for him and loved mm-hmm. him and came to see him all the time. And. Mm-hmm. I don't know. One night, my dad and I did, decided to go to a movie, and we saw a movie with um, God, Elizabeth Taylor and uh, Richard Woodward, Mark or something. And uh, he looks at her, and they're in the sand, and they're talking, and he puts his hand on top of hers, and he tells her he's in love with her. Mm-hmm. And I just found that so romantic. And so when I got back to the, <laughs> to the sidewalk, Lou was coming around to all the tables and you know, talking, and I had my brother there. He was very young. And it was getting close to Christmas time, so Lou was doing some Christmas songs too. And my birthday, of course, was in November. I'm a Thanksgiving Day baby. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I was born on Thanksgiving Day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's just working the room and making the room and everything. And he said, oh, where where were you tonight? And I said, oh, I was out. I went and saw this fabulous movie. And I'm telling him, and I'm, you know, I'm talking to the people and everything. And uh, I feel him really looking at me. Mm -hmm. And I start to tell him about the movie. Mm -hmm. And as I'm telling him the story, I'm looking in his eyes, and he's looking in mine, and he put his hand on top of mine. Mm -hmm. And I said, and then Elizabeth Taylor said to him, I think I love you. Oh, wow. And he looked at me, and and he said, yes. And he said, and what did Richard Burton say? And I said, he said, I think I love you. Oh, my goodness. That moment? Uh, Yes. So so it's safe to say it was love love at first sight, huh? (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) You're right. It was. Holy cow. Wow. It really was. And he did. He said, I think I love you. Now, um, Lana, a couple of things. Now, what year was this? Was this in what year was this? This um, nineteen sixty, uh, fifty nine, fifty eight, sixty. 
Mm-hmm. And um, you felt you felt you felt the same about Lou when he said that. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Wow. Absolutely, so, there was something uh, about. So it it got to the point where I was going to the sidewalk every night, you know. Wow. <clears throat> and one night, um, I had talked to Lou and told him that I had some friends that I knew because I was a model, too, with Revlon, that I knew that was coming in from uh, New Orleans and at the Shamrock Hilton Hotel, and they like to usually have entertainment there. Mm -hmm. And I said, so if you'd be interested, you know, after your uh, show at the sidewalk, you could probably pick up, you know, some great money there. Mm -hmm. And... He said, oh, well, yeah, would you introduce me to the people? And I said, well, sure. And he said, well, when can we meet each other and and do this? I said, well, as soon as they get to town. And he said, oh, okay. So a couple of days go by. Excuse me, I've got something in the air here. And... uh, so sure enough, I called him, and the people were coming to town, and he said, okay. He said, um, and I knew when I called him, I was purposely setting this up. And why do you say you're you're purposely setting it up? Because I knew that I was in love with him, and I knew he was in love with me. I just... no, no, no. Let me ask you a question now. These audiences, I'm sure they're they're very captivated in what they're hearing now. And we are talking to the lovely Lana Rawls, um, who was married to uh, Lou Rawls, um, this famous singer. <laughs> now, um, Lana, did I know um, Lou knew in his mind he was taking a, a risk, falling in love with a Caucasian woman back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. So, how were you all able to navigate? In a in a civil rights movement as well as um, Jim Crow time, et cetera. Well, <clears throat> the band that was there had always seen me with Ralph, and of course, and they got with Lou and everything. And um, Lou called me one night, and we were talking. I gave him my number, mm-hmm. and he said, "Lana, he said, uh, can I see you away from?" the you know the club I said yes you can so he gives me his address here in Houston and he was standing out under a tree now this is three o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and um, he said can you come by and we, we'll sit in the car and talk and I said oh yeah sure okay So he goes to work. I go see him at work, don't say a thing. And the group knew what was going on. They could could feel it. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys was taking him home from the group, see. Mm -hmm. So they really knew what was happening. And so sure enough, I go and I meet him at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe 3.30. And I'm driving over there. And as I'm driving... Lord and behold, cop cars are going around and around me with their lights on. Wow. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because I was, like, in Fourth Ward. Mm -hmm. And the cop pulls me over, and he's talking to me, and he said, honey, um, you know, what's going on here and so forth and so on. I said, oh, my God, I'm so glad to see y'all. And I put on this crying act. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was trying to get to Hobby Airport. Mm -hmm. And I got lost. I turned on the wrong street, and I'm completely lost. And they said, oh, honey, don't worry about a thing, because I had very long blonde hair. Mm -hmm. And they said, don't you worry about a thing. And I said, Oh, okay, are you sure? And they said, yeah, follow us. And I said, oh, okay, thank you so much, and so forth and so on. Guess but what? Wait, but, 
but, but not they a, took a, me all the way to Hobby Airport. <laughs> and you were on your way to pick up Lou? Yes. <laughs> and it was a long ways, you know. Mm-hmm. And they put me in a parking area, walked me into Hobby Airport. Mm-hmm. One of the officers did. And I was saying, you know, y'all don't have to take me all all the way there now. I, I know where I am now. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, honey. You know, at 3 mm-hmm. o'clock in the morning, it's too dangerous mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. out and about and all that. So sure mm-hmm. enough, I got upstairs in Hobby Airport, the airport, and I called Lou. Mm-hmm. And he said, where in the world are you? And I told him what happened. And... He said, well, get in your car and come on. He was renting a room in this lady's rooming house. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, Lou, um, I don't know. I said, I don't know about that. And I said, you know, if they see me again... They're going to stop me, and they're going to know something's up. They're not, you know, they'll know mm-hmm. something's happening. Now, you don't get right, lost right. in that area all the time. Mm-hmm. And he said, I don't care. Mm-hmm. He said, they can bring you to the house here. I don't mm-hmm. care. I want to see you. I'm going to see you. And... I'm going to fall madly in love with you. And and that's what happened. And that's what happened. No, well, and I did. A... I went uh-huh. back and he was standing out under a tree there in the front yard and it's dark of course. Mm-hmm. I he opened up I was in my mom's Cadillac. He opened up the door, he slid in the front seat and I had my hand like in in the middle of the you know, the chair there, it was a one-seater, and he put his hand on top of mine, pulled me into his arms, Mm -hmm. and kissed me like I had never been kissed before. (laughs) Well, you can tell the man truly, truly loved you, and it um, shows in so many ways. Now, you're, um, you all being together, um, how many years were you all together? Pardon? How many years were you and Lou together? Oh, my God. From then on, we were together. We didn't get married then, but Mm -hmm. we were were together for years. We were married uh, like 20-something years, and it was a struggle. It was hard. Now, what made it such a struggle? Is it because of the uh, the uh, racial the, the, yes. the, the, the race yes. difference? Yes. Now, what are some because of the experiences everywhere you that we went together, like uh, when he left Houston, he was going to Cleveland, Ohio, to work. Mm-hmm. When he mm-hmm. left, okay, I go to the airport with him. I'm following the van that's taken him to the airport. But Mm -hmm. prior to that, the big thing was, of course, we were in love. We were romancing. I would put a black wig and put black paint on my face. Oh, my goodness. To go into the motel. Yes, it did. Worked like a charm. (laughs) Wow. Wow. And, um, of course, I could never come out, mm -hmm. you know, unless it was nighttime. So Lou would, the next day on a Sunday, he would go and buy us soul food and everything. We'd sit in the middle of the bed. He'd call his mom. I'd talk to her. She'd talk to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we'd come out at night. Now, when did um when did your dad find out about you all dating, and how did he feel about it? Oh, my God. It was horrible. My mother had made it a point to go over to my apartment. I left all my stuff here in Houston. My clothes, my furniture, everything. And my mother took my brother over to my apartment, and she went through my stuff. And I had five pictures of Lou from Capitol Records. Mm -hmm. And I still have those pictures to this day with his handwriting on it, Mm -hmm. telling me how much he loved me. 
Wow. And my mother took those pictures, looked at them, tore them up, burned them, and then put them down the commode. Oh, my goodness. So it's safe to say they did not take it well at all? Uh, not at all. Wow. So I oh. left on, went, went on to Chicago, um, to Cleveland to meet with him. And um, then he got an offer from Capitol or something, and he had to leave. And he left me there with a family that we met there that mm-hmm. were um, a Mr. and Mrs. They owned a law company there. Mm-hmm. And it was wonderful. You know, they had kids and everything, and I stayed with them because Lou had to go on to another date. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have the money for me to be traveling and traveling with him then. Mm-hmm. And so I stayed with Lois and her mm-hmm. husband, Harold, mm-hmm. and their kids. And I stayed for a couple of months with them. And then Lou called me and said, I want you to come. We're going to get us a place. And he was still struggling. And I wasn't working because I didn't know anything about Ohio, and it was freezing there. Snow was everywhere. Yeah, I know that was a cultural shock coming from Houston. Oh, you better believe it, baby, because it does not snow mm-hmm. in Houston, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lana, um, <laughs> now let's switch gears for a minute. Um, we can come back to this. But what year did you uh, first meet Sam Cook? Oh, let's see. I met him at Capitol. Probably three years after I was with Lou, Mm -hmm. because Lou was traveling a lot then. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night Lou was recording in Capitol, and I was there. And so was Joe Glazer, who discovered um, uh, Saxmo in Mm -hmm. Louisiana. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, we were, you know, I was sitting around in there with uh, Bob Glazer and all of them. And Sam was in there, and they were doing a recording. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I walked in there, and Sam was there. And he embraced me and, you know, the whole nine yards. And he said, well, Lou was right. And I said, oh, you're so nice. And, of course, you know, my heart is beating a thousand miles a minute, too, (laughs) like anybody else. Huh? You heard a lot about Sam before you met him? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, his son had, you know, drowned. And there was a lot of sadness going on. But Sam was wonderful. And him and Lou would play and have to do the song again and again and then Lou would be singing to me and then Sam would say well let me sing to her too and everybody <laughs> in the whole studio was just laughing you know mm-hmm. and um, Bob Glazer was there and um, it was just fabulous I mean it was an air of nobody could believe it it was very light him and Sam were kibitzing together and kind of pushing on each other, and Lou would say, don't get too close to my woman. And Mm -hmm. Sam would say, okay. And he'd say, when did you hear about me? And I said, I was dancing to You Send Me when I was 15 years old. Oh, my goodness. And he said, oh, my God, then we got something to talk about. (laughs) And I said, no, we don't have nothing to talk about, Sam. He -hmm. was so nice. His humility Mm -hmm. and everything was incredible. Wow, wow. And now, then, of course, he, you know, they saw each other all the time. Mm-hmm. And then and it, he came to our house. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and um, he, would, he would come and um, go in the refrigerator and do everything as if he lived there? Oh, yeah. He made him a sandwich mm-hmm. and uh, would get him a beer because Lou had done this commercial, commercial for Country Club uh-huh. beer. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> So he had been to the dentist, and he came by our house on Gramercy Place. That was our first house at 2120 South Gramercy Place. 
Mm-hmm. And Lord and behold, I went to the door, and he knocked on it, and I opened it. And Lou was there, and he said, hey, man, what's going on? And Lou and Sam were sitting, you know, in the living room, and there was a big plate glass window there and then the pool. And uh, Sam said, where is my godson? Lou Jr. was a year and a half old, maybe Uh going on kind of two. And I said, oh, let me go get him. And which I did. I went in the room and changed his diaper and got him. And I brought him out a little T-shirt. And any other time Sam would come over there, or he'd see Sam, Sam would play with him. And he would laugh and shake stuff and everything else. And I brought Lou Jr. in and went to give him to Sam to sit on his lap. And when I did, Lou Jr. was hysterical. Now, um, Lana, this was on December 11th, 1964, the night Sam Cooke got killed. Is that correct? Yes. And and you're saying that um, normally uh, Lou Jr. would go nuts when he saw Sam so happy. Oh, he loved him. He yeah, scared. he loved mm-hmm. him. He mm-hmm. knew, you know, I man mm-hmm. didn't know he was his godfather, but he, he loved Sam because Sam would get down on the floor and play with him and roll a ball or whatever. Mm-hmm. And... Mm-hmm. um. Uh, Lou Jr. was hysterical, mm-hmm. kicking, clawing, and everything. And I'm standing up. Lou was sitting in the, in the other chair close to Sam. And he said, son, what's wrong? What's wrong? And mm-hmm. Sam's just looking at Lou Jr. And Sam's trying to talk to him. And Lou's trying to talk to him. And I'm just standing there, you know, my God, what's happening? And then Lou takes him. Lou hands him to me. And I take Lou Jr. back into his room. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lou and I, that we had talked to Sam, and the next night we were going to go to Redondo Beach, mm-hmm. Barbara, his wife, Sam, Lou and I, and we were going to go see uh, Les McCann, because Les mm-hmm. McCann plays and Lou Rawl sings. That was Lou's first album. Wow. Now, so let me ask we you a were... question, Anna, before, before you go on, because I want my audience to, to really grasp what you're saying. Um, now, um, Sam, when, he, when Sam came over, was, did he want Lou to go out with him that night? Or was, because um, many um, accounts say that um, Lou regretted not going out with Sam because yeah. um, he wanted, because he had to, he stayed home with you to get ready for the next day. But yes, wanted... that's true. And we were we were so shocked with Lou Jr. that Lou told him no too, uh-huh. because uh-huh. we started taking Lou Jr.'s fever and everything else. And Sam was going to Martoni's, right? Uh-huh. And uh, Lou had said, "Man, if I if I can get my child, you know, see if there's something wrong with him or whatever, uh, don't worry, I can catch up with you if I decide to come." Mm-hmm. And so Sam told him where he was going to be, so forth and so on. And after Sam left and we got Lou Jr. down and everything and the sitter had come, and Lou said, you know what, there is a great movie, and I can't even remember it right now. But he said, I want you to see it, babe. And it was a, about an interracial couple and so forth and so on. And we went to the movie. Mm-hmm. And he said, I don't want to go to Martoni's. You know, I'm in a club all the time. Mm -hmm. I want to be with you. And I said, okay, baby, whatever you say. Mm -hmm. And as we're driving home, I'll never forget it. At 12 o'clock, I looked at Lou and I said, I wonder what Sam is doing right now. And he Mm -hmm. said, oh, I don't know. He's, you know, probably at the Whiskey Go-Go, which he was. Mm -hmm. And... um, he said, you know, he'll be he'll be getting home pretty soon. Mm-hmm. And so we got home and, um, you know, we had a snack and we went to bed. And then we got a call at 3 o'clock in the morning, probably, you yeah, know, between 3 and 4. Mm-hmm. And Lou was sound asleep, so I reached over Lou to get the phone. And it was Lou's mother, Evelyn. Mm-hmm. Because she was listening to the radio 
or one of her friends called her something to that effect Mm -hmm. and had told her Sam was dead. And she was crying hysterically. And I'm like, Evelyn, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? And she said, Lana, Lana, and she's screaming. And she said, Sam is dead. And I'm... I'm numb, I, 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 you know, just like you're talking to me now and somebody tells you in a few hours I'm dead. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, we yeah. were in his presence. Right, right. And uh, Lou said, who's on the phone? Hey, move over, because I was pushing on him. Mm-hmm. And I said, Lou, Lou, wake up, wake up, wake up. And he did, and he said, what is wrong? Who was that? And I said, it was your mom, and I went on to, you know, I went on to tell him, and my God, he got big tears in his eyes and everything, and mm-hmm. we were getting calls to go to Sam's house. Mm-hmm. And Did we, you all go? Yes, of course. Yeah, mm-hmm. we got up, and we went. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we got to his home in Los Feliz, uh it was full. J. W. Alexander was there. Every, every Barbara was screaming, you know, and they called a doctor. A doctor was walking through there, giving people, you know, anything to keep them calm. I mean, the whole house was hysterical. The kids, everything. Now, this is about and, four in the morning now, Lana. Yes. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Now, when you went there, when you and Lou went there, and you were questioning what happened, what was the account that they gave you? On what happened? Exactly. They didn't give me an account. She she said she had him there. She didn't have to kill him. Oh wow! That was what Barbara said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She had him there. She didn't have to kill him. Well, then by oh. then it's breaking news, and this is a cheap dive motel. This is where the truck drivers went. Mm-hmm. You well, know, what was out, out on a crummy, crummy crummy head. Yeah, it was in Figueroa. Yeah, I know that it, it was a you know that whole that motel actually. It wasn't even a hotel. It was a motel. Yeah, and it was a motel. Is, and the a thing is that uh, yeah, and uh, Sam would never be anywhere like that. But you no. know, you said something very interesting that BG also wrote in her book, um, um, the Redemption of Sam Cooke. Where she was saying that um, Barbara was making statements like, you know, she led Sam there or set him up there and stuff. And based upon what you just said, it kind of seemed very odd that she said they had him there. Um, why did they, you didn't have to kill him? That's a very strange statement. Don't you think? Yes. Yeah. What do you think it she was. meant by that? I. Uh, well, you know, come to find out, she was talking about the Oriental girl because we didn't know any of this at the time. Our mm-hmm. concern was just trying to get to her and to make sure. And JW is calling us. Every everybody's calling, you know, Lou, get here, get here, get here, mm-hmm. because you know they all grew up in Chicago and everywhere together. Right. But so when you know, and the and when his, he Barbara had his music playing, he was. It was so loud, you could have heard it five miles away in her house. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, it was so loud. And then they they were pouring the drinks, and she was, you know, getting a little tipsy. And then the, the crying started, and then more people were coming, and more people were coming. And I excused myself because I wanted to cry like a baby, too. I excused mm-hmm. myself, and I asked to go to, you know, to the restroom. And she said, oh, yeah, she said, go in my room. And she said, go in Sam's bathroom, mm-hmm. which I did. And when I went in there, every scent of him, like I went to wash my hands and wipe them on his towel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was just like he was standing there. Oh, my goodness. His body aroma, for he had just showered and used that towel. Wow. And my That's heart how- was just dying, uh, just breaking. Oh, wow. So um, now, 
Lana, as time went on in the night and then the next day, um, as you were gathering more information about it, what did it look like actually happened? We know what was reported in terms of the death of Sam Cook and the murder of Sam Cook, but what actually, was, as you put the pieces together, what conclusion did you and Lee come to? Well, Lou knew some people that talked to him at Martoni's or didn't talk to him at Martoni's uh, because Lou was having to get ready to go back out on the road. Mm-hmm. And uh, who, who said, you know, there were so many stories going around at that point. Mm-hmm. There really was. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lou was just so distraught because you got to remember Years before them, when Lou and Sam were singing the gospel together, they were in Tennessee, and uh, they were going to a to a show, and they were going over a hill, and they were in a convertible, and they the chauffeur, the man drive not the chauffeur, but one of their guys was driving, and they kept asking him if he was sleepy, and he said no. Well, they ended up going under an Mm eighteen-wheeler from the Mm -hmm. fog. Wow! And Lou's head was cut open from the front of his forehead all the way down to his neck. Wow! His brains were laying in the highway in Tennessee. Holy! Sam was sitting in the front seat, and Sam only got a speck of glass in his eye. And in fact, in the book, I had that picture of Sam. So it's wow. in the book. Wow. Now, now, now said, speaking, of the, speaking of the book, ladies and gentlemen, um, for those who are um, just tuning in, we're talking to the lovely Nana Ross, the um, widow of the late, great Lou Ross. And she's written a book. Um, you've got to purchase the book. It is um, posting on your screen right now, ladies and gentlemen. This is the book. It's called uh, Love is a Hurting Thing. It's available on Amazon. It's, it's available on Kindle. Wherever any fine books are sold, this is um, where the book is available, and Lana is bearing her heart and soul. Kind of giving snippets about some of the context that is in the book. How much is the book going for, Lana? Where can they, um, it, there's it 19 chapters in the book mm-hmm. concerning uh, Duke Ellington, too, because Duke Elling, Sam was Luana's godfather, mm-hmm. and Duke Ellington went, Duke Ellington was Luana's godfather. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And mm-hmm. when I was pregnant with Luana and we were in New York at the Waldorf Astoria, Duke Ellington, I, his little guy that used to drive him around, we were eating pistachio ice cream and sausages with my big belly <laughs> sitting out in a sequin gown. And Lou mm-hmm. was eating it, too. Wow. Now, um, aside from your husband, um, Lou Rawls, who was one of the most fascinating people you've ever met um, being affiliated with that industry? Oh, yeah. So many people. Does anyone stand out in your mind that that, that stands out as one of the most fascinating? It sounds like Sam Cooke was one of them. Sam Cooke, Duke Duke Ellington was unbelievable. Well, mm-hmm. that was during we, Pat Nixon and uh, Miss, uh, President Nixon. It mm-hmm. was his birthday. It was Duke Ellington's birthday, and mm-hmm. we were invited to his birthday party. And every black entertainer that was prominent, Joe Williams, uh, everybody was there. Mm-hmm. It was even mm-hmm. in Jet Magazine, pages and pages of all of us arriving at mm-hmm. the White House. And the reason they had it at the White House is because Duke Ellington's grandfather helped build the White House. He was a slave. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, um, that, is an, that is amazing stuff you're telling us. Um, um, you know, and this is also in your book as well, um, Lana? Yes. All of it no. is in the book and so much more. There's 150 pictures in the book. Mm-hmm. Rare, and, rare, never been seen, never seen before pictures, ladies and gentlemen. Mind, I'm about to mind you. Um, you've seen a lot, a lot of pictures of Lou Rawls, but you've never seen some of these. But pictures you've never seen these. <laughs> Correct. Now, now, um, 
Now, Lana, um, during the civil rights movement in the 60s, um, let's say right after um, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, how was it for you being a young Caucasian woman dating an African-American man, uh, married to an African-American man, how was it in the household, and how was it around among your peers during that time? In my around in the household, because we lived in in Baldwin Hills then. That Red Fox was our neighbor up at the top. Johnny Guitar Watson was our neighbor on the mm-hmm. same street, and Ray Charles and Della was right across the street. And Della Charles loved Lou Rawls. Mhm. And. Uh, I mean, there was just so, so much. So when I would travel with Lou, especially when I first started, I would have, when I would go to the restrooms, I would have young ladies in there that knew how to fight and work with knives and things, jam me in those bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And after I would be gone for a certain length of time, Lou would go and get somebody and send them in there. And I got stabbed several times. Are you serious? Really? Oh yes, yes. Just for just for being his wife? Just just for being with him. They didn't know if I was his wife. Uh, I could have been his woman. Uh, who you know, whatever you want to say. Wow. That and they used to gang on, up on me all the time. I mean, mm-hmm. it got to the point. The the more popular that he became and famous, mm-hmm. it got worse. So how did you deal with that, Lana, knowing that um, that is the mentality of the ladies? Um, well, it, I just, you know, I was just very nice. I ended up owning a black club here in Houston called Ebony Lawn, mm-hmm. and it was um, incredible. Mm-hmm. Me and my girlfriend um, and um, Giovanni, we had this club. And I used to work it every single day. And I just said, you know, you're not going to rock my world. Of course, I had, wasn't with Lou then because I we had filed for divorce. Because nobody wanted to leave. Nobody wanted us together. No one wanted any peace for us. And well, it not, was, not, and, not, 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 that, that was a struggle, but... It was mainly because of um, you being white and him being black. That's the main reason why they fought against you. Yes. And I was Miss Revelon. I was Miss uh-huh. Del Rio, Texas. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, did, it, did it put a lot of unnecessary stress on the marriage because of that? Oh, God, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and how did oh, you yes. deal with it? Well, being the man... <laughs> How do a lot of men deal with it? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know, for men, a lot of times um, we don't really look at it that hard because, you know, if we love that woman, it's just, it comes with the territory. So it's not even a big deal. I'm not going to let anybody uh, – I know how I feel, and I'm not going to let anybody uh, affect that. That's how we typically look at it. Now, I understand this is the 60s. This is a brutal time where, you know, they just see you even talking to one no, because, um, you know, that's what got Emmett, Emmett Till killed. Um, back in 1955, the fact they said he whistled at a white woman. So for a black man in that period to be with one, I know he was asking for hell on his hands, and I understand that. But, love, but you know, love causes all. Right. But you know what, Gerard? When Lou had this accident with Sam, uh-huh. it was then told, and there's a picture in the book of Sam, Lou, and Barbara walking up one of those ramps going into the plane, mm-hmm. you know, those roll-on ramp things. Right. Lou has his hat on. Lou didn't even know who he was then when they got him to, because the hospital did not want to treat Lou. And Sam oh, was wow. paying them in Tennessee to take care of Lou. Oh, wow. And he didn't want to leave Lou in that hospital. When Lou walked up on that plane with Sam and Barbara, he didn't even know who he was. Lou's brains, practically all of them, were left in the Tennessee Highway. Oh, my goodness. How did he survive? And it caused Lou to be to become very... He got angry very quickly. Mm-hmm. He could take uh, 
something you could say and it wouldn't be he wouldn't see it that way. It was hard. Wow. But I loved him. He was the love of my life. Wow. No, no, and no, I no, cry no. about him to this day. I was with him. Even though we were divorced and had mm-hmm. been divorced, Lou and I still saw each other, even though he had another wife. Mm-hmm. We, he mm-hmm. would, I would go wherever he was. And mm-hmm. when my daughter got him out of Mexico because his third wife stuck him down there, for mm-hmm. cancer treatments on hot rocks, mm-hmm. uh, it was bad. I mean, mm-hmm. I got on a plane, and I went and stayed with Lou a month and a half before he died. Oh, my goodness. I never you... left the room. Never once did I leave his room. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that's love. That's love, that's love now, baby. That is truly love. Now, Lana, um... Once, and I want to say this, I'm, 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 I'm thoroughly, I hope everybody who's listening, this is a wonderful, wonderful lady, um, iconic figure, the widow of uh, the legendary Lee Rawls on the Sherrard show this, this evening. Now, Lana, um, many accounts say that after Sam Cook um, had gotten murdered, um, Lou was so shaken that he began to drink heavily. Is that true? Yes. And, and and what led to that? Is that because he was um, he was concerned that it was going to happen to him, or what was his perspective that led to that? Uh, I think truly what it was was the accident that they had had in Nashville, and come mm-hmm. to find out, I know someone that has uh, a terrible head injury, and I've talked with doctors, mm-hmm. and they said the same thing. You mm-hmm. you can't put your brains back in your head the way you're born. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Right. And his were picked up with a shovel. Oh, my goodness. Uh, That is horrendous. I can't, wow, I I can't even imagine, you know, um, even seeing something like that, let alone having to, you know, go through that. I'm sure it was hours and hours of surgery in order to get him back to normal. Right, and he got, you know, a lot of times, I mean, especially if you set off and you're doing some drugs with people and you know that's what the entertainment business kind of you're there do you take part you know who knows but Mm -hmm. I know for Lou so much of it was from his head accident and I Mm -hmm. found that out through many many doctors Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. many many so this accident happened in 1962 or 63? The accident, oh, goodness. Uh, no, I think it happened before then. Okay, all right. Now, now um, so Lou had to take medication the rest of his life after the accident? Lou wouldn't take it. Really? What was the reason? He just didn't want to take it. He didn't, he didn't, Lou took no kind of pills. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a few vitamins, but that was it. He wasn't a so, pill head. So it probably gave him massive headaches throughout periodically, huh? Yeah. Mm. Now, um, um, Lana, we'll spend the rest of the few minutes, we'll spend a few minutes talking about a, an individual that many people know, um, more in, infamous than he is famous. Um, what, what was the year that you met Alan Klein? Oh, man. Oh, golly. I don't know. I'd really have to go back to the book because mm-hmm. we're getting ready to, to put together another thing, mm-hmm. and I'm working on that, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, what was your impression when you first met him? Oh, goodness. Um, they varied. You mm-hmm. know, so many times when you're in in that when you're in that business, you meet somebody one time and they're one way. You meet somebody the next time and they're another way. Mm-hmm. And I had 
uh, we'd go up to Sam's office, and J.W. Alexander would be up there, and people would be hanging out. I really didn't care for him too much. Mm-hmm. Uh I just, I don't know, I just got a very funny feeling being around him. Mm. And he was a talker. He would just talk, 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 you know. He could sell you (laughs) probably anything in the world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, living that life, let me tell you something, and you, I'm sure you know this, it's Mm -hmm. the hardest thing in the world. It's glamorous. It's wonderful. You got all the women you can handle standing outside the dressing room, wanting to do anything you want to do. The mm-hmm. drugs, the the lies, the I I had two women try to kill my son. The drug Lou up, Jr. literally, yeah, Lou Junior. Mm-hmm. What was the reason behind that? Uh, they were seeing Lou, and one of them wanted him so bad, she felt mm-hmm. like if he lost his family, mm-hmm. that... Oh, uh, that's insane. Yeah. Under the mm-hmm. orange tree. We had an orange tree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and wow. she drove up and almost hit him on his little tricycle, mm-hmm. and... It, Paul Mooney knows this story because mm-hmm. I was looking for this girl. Mm-hmm. And somebody from HB's office, HB Barnum, called the house mm-hmm. because, you know, to contact me to let me know that the girl was at HB's office. And mm-hmm. I jumped in my car and took off like a bat out of you know where. Mm-hmm. And got there, and Paul Mooney was sitting out in front of uh, HB's office on like a step or something, you know. And the guys were sitting around talking, and he mm-hmm. had a big, tall Seven Up bottle, mm-hmm. and he had finished it. <laughs> and I walked by and got it, and said, "I'll buy you another one." <laughs> and I walked, I busted it on the sidewalk there where he was sitting. Mm-hmm. And walked in there. Wow. And they got her out the back door. Wow. Because I was going to stick it in her neck and cut her. Wow. That's, wow. I that's, mean, that's we're a, talking about my child, you know? That's correct. That's unbelievable. That's going way, way too far. That's a phenomenon. And I, you just don't know. It was. Did they press charges against you? N- no. No. Because she just flipped. She went somewhere. And one of, uh, God knows only who, put her somewhere and, you know, and I sent a message out and I said, honey, don't mess with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't mess with my children. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. It was hard. uh, Wow. Lana, you're, you're, you're a very, very special, uh, lady. I'm so glad that, um. Have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to um, just sit down and talk on the Sherrard show. I got two more questions for you, uh, maybe three, and then we'll we'll um, close it on a good note, uh, if the Lord say so. Now, Lana, what did you know about? Um, how did you like J. W. Alexander? Sam Cooke's manager. Um, yeah, I think there's a picture of J. W. in the book too. We were at a party. I had cooked a. a Oh, God, I don't know how many gallons of gumbo in a pot that was bigger than the stove, I think. Mm -hmm. And we were having a a little party because J.W. was becoming Lou's manager. And there was a lot of little idle talk. You know, you always hear snippets of things, Mm -hmm. you know. But I really, I, I tried to do my best. I, w- I didn't want to be that part of of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a wife, a mother, and um, I didn't, there were so many places I didn't go with Lou because, you know, when we first got together, I mean, I, I couldn't travel with him because 
uh, even in Cleveland, Ohio, when I flew to Cleveland to be with him, the mm-hmm. hotel, I had a room, he had a room, in another hotel, okay? He got mm-hmm. there before me. This is when he left Houston. And then I gave up everything I had here, and I went there. Do mm-hmm. you know that we ended up suing those hotels from the family I lived with because they were lawyers? Because they would listen in on our telephone calls and called me a whore and him a pimp. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. you have no idea. I have the clippings from the newspapers. <laughs> but now, um, this is a question I'm sure that many want to ask, and this is just a question, uh, Lana. So um, you, you loving Lou so much, which I can have no doubts about, what caused you to divorce him or you ought to get a divorce? Um being unfaithful. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't be the kind of wife I wanted to be because there were, there was one girl that claimed she was a mobster's daughter. Mm-hmm. And everywhere Lou went, all of the band members, if Lou got on a plane, the girl was on the plane sitting on his aisle. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. If when he got to the hotel, she'd have the suite next to his. Oh my! And this went on and on and on. And finally, the band member, one of the wives, called me. Now you got to remember, I then was five and a half, six months pregnant with Luana, and I'm talking about a big baby. Hmm. And she called me and told me, she said, Lana, all the band members are scared to death that if Lou doesn't do what this girl says, Mm -hmm. who she is, because she is a mobster's daughter, Mm -hmm. she's going to have them killed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got off the phone with her. I was on the phone with her all day. Then the mobster's daughter literally called my house, and I was on the phone with her. And I told her, honey, can you excuse me, please? And you call me back in about four hours or call me back tomorrow because I've got to go to the doctor. I said, you know, I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. And she laughed and said, yes, she was pregnant, too. Oh, wow. Okay. I hung the phone up, got BB, our housekeeper that was with us for years and years and years and years, helped me. I put, I went to L.A. airport, put a big bag in front of me, a beige handbag, and had my fur on and had the gun inside my purse Hmm. and got on the airplane. Mm Mm-hmm. And Lou was in Washington at an outdoor theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, HB was jumping up and down, and the band members were playing and everything. I got into a car. They drove me over into this part of Washington where they were. Mm -hmm. And I got out. I walked up those tiny stairs. I went and checked out his dressing room first. Mm Mm-hmm. And I made it up the stairs because I'm talking about I was huge. I had a nine pound, twenty two inch daughter. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it looked mm-hmm. like I was going to have twins. Now and, Lou was in uh, he was in Washington D.C. or the state of Washington? Yeah, he was in Washington D.C. I don't know the furthest one from Houston that I okay. remember. <laughs> I, I mean, okay. I was on the airplane for six hours. Swelling, yeah, hands, feet, everything. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, but I did, I was standing on the side of, you know, he would walk off on that side. Mm-hmm. And HB is directing and everything. Well, then HB backed up on the stage and turned and he saw me. Mm-hmm. And when he saw me, <laughs> he kind of moved back into the band area. 
And then some of the guys, HB was saying, telling them, man, look to the right, look to the right. Lana's over there. And they knew, how could I get there? You know, you couldn't fly then. They wouldn't allow you to fly. But I pulled it off so well. Mm-hmm. And uh, then Lou was trying to get down front and was, you know, being his wonderful self. But there were three seats that were empty on that front row. Mm-hmm. And I figured those were her seats. So the band kind of gets off kilter on one of his songs or something. So he begins to back up to see what's going on. And when he does, HB, or one of the band members, is saying, man, look, look, look to your left over there. It's Lana. And so Lou was joking, and he said, man, y'all are crazy. Now, he's on stage. And sure enough, he looked over there, and he saw me. Mm -hmm. And he went to the front of the stage Mm -hmm. because I had a gun in my purse. You were going to shoot Lou or the lady? No, I was going to shoot the lady. Oh, wow. So what did Lou, so and, did Lou uh, stop the music? And, and so playing? Lou just ends up closing down the show, you know, maybe doing one song or another half a song, his closing songs, and HB's getting off the, they're all scrambling. So we get in the, you know, the ride to go to the hotel, this gorgeous hotel we're staying in, and... He looks at me and he said, how did you get here? I said, on the airplane. On the airplane. I said, your woman is calling the house. And I'm getting ready to go into labor pretty soon, and I don't need this. And he said, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I said, "Uh uh-huh. We got in the room, Sherrod. It wasn't two minutes, and the phone rang. This girl knew every single step, Lou took and it was her Mm -hmm. and he he said to her he said you know what I don't think you want to stay on this phone because you'll never guess who I have sitting here in my room and she said well I hope it's not another woman or something to that effect you know and he says "Mm, it's my Lana my wife she said, Lana's not here. I've been on the phone with her all day. <laughs> and he said, honey, I hope you ain't in that suite across the hall. Because she's sitting here with a, a pistol mm-hmm. laying out on the table. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And no. I just <laughs> raised my voice. <laughs> wow. Lana, um, you know, uh, it's so much more we I want to talk to you about, but I'm gonna I don't want to give my audience all of uh, everything away in terms of the book because they won't buy it. So they right. have to buy the book. You all have to buy the book. Um, yeah, love is a hurting thing. Now it's um it's in it's written by you and B G Rule. Is that correct? Right. And um, it's an absolute wonderful book. Purchase it on Amazon or anywhere any uh, fine books are sold. Every fine book is sold. Um, I'm speaking to the lovely Lana Rawls. Um, if you haven't heard what we were speaking about, you missed the treat. Um, now, one last thing, Lana. Where can um, people find you on social media? Where can they locate you? Uh, leave a comment about your interview. Ask questions. Where can they be located? Um, on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Under? No, Lana Rawls. Good. Okay, great. Um, Lana, thank you so much for being a guest on the Sherrard Show. I so appreciate that. Um, I hope you can be able to come on and do a part two interview with me as well um, very, very soon. Is that okay? I sure will. Thank you so much, Lana. Um, I am so to- happy that we got together to do this. Me too. Me too. I'm, I'm, I've always, always been a fan of your husband, and now I'm a fan of you. Um, Lou Rawls Jr. was also a guest on the show with David Ruffin Jr. Um, last year, and I really enjoyed them as well. And I want to thank you again, and thank you all, uh, audience, for um, listening in. Um, this, you will be able to see this broadcast again um, in another week where you can be able to also inquire about Lana Rawls. I'm Sherrard. 
And when we come back on our next episode of the Sherrard Show, we've got a very, very special guest that's going to be on. Mr. Sonny Cool is going to be on the Sherrard Show next. I'm Sherrard. Have a great evening. We'll talk soon.